The shotgun's been around for a long, long time. A lot of myths, a lot of old wives' tales, a lot of misunderstanding about the weapon. What we're going to try and do in this ensuing video is to try and get some points across about what the shotgun will do and equally as important what it will not do, what it is not capable of doing. It has tremendous devastating close-up power. It's an excellent zero to a hundred plus yards weapon dependent on what ammunition you're feeding through it. It is both a simple and a complicated weapon to understand. If you take advantage of the ammunition variables with it, you need to understand how to use it. The myths about the recoil, the muzzle flip, everything else are all controlled by good techniques, good shooting stances. It is a very effective special purpose weapon. As such, this video is not going to supplant a good training course. And my personal suggestion is to go to as many different schools and training centers as you can, pick up everybody's ideas and adapt those to your own personal situation. We will be using, because of this, we will be using a volunteer student who has not fired the gun before and we'll simulate training him up. We'll start him off with the basics and we'll use him to demonstrate how easy the weapon is to learn how easy it is to shoot and to shoot very effectively in a relatively short space of time. We've got a selection of the most commonly used 12 gauges these days. They are all single magazine tube fed um, as opposed to South African Neostead which is, has two magazine tubes or an over and under or side by side which the cartridges are fed straight into the chamber. The Winchester 97 become real popular with action shooters, um, three-gun action shooters. It's been around for literally a hundred years. Uh, excellent weapon, extremely reliable, extremely easy to operate. Has no external safety button. The only safe on it is on half cock when you're carrying. Um, to open this action, if the hammer's back, you need to depress the button run the bolt um, and obviously need to be extremely careful when lowering the hammer. Uh, as I said, an extremely reliable weapon. The only thing when you're firing this type of weapon, obviously when the bolt comes back, is to keep your thumb on top, which is the preferred method we're going to use during this video when we're, we're doing the shooting instruction. Um, thumb on top, if you don't, it's pretty obvious what what's going to happen when the bolt comes back. So we maintain that thumb position with all the weapons. That's about it on the 97. We're going to ditch that and go on to the three most common weapon types that are used these days. Uh, for simplicity's sake, I'm going to start with the 1187. We have two guns that are tricked out here. I'm going to go through the modifications this one has been built by Scattergun Technologies and as you can see all of these or two of these guns that we're utilizing now have slings on them. A lot of people don't like slings because they bunch up, they get in the way and everything else but they're essential for training, for transitioning, for going to open hands, going to a handgun or merely to, to retain the weapon on your body so that you can get to a telephone call law enforcement. Um, the way we get around having a sling hanging loose, use a Velcro strap and that just detaches the whole sling and then the sling's available for use. In this case, my personal preference for a team type sling, I prefer the Heckler and Koch slings. Um, they're the simplest, they've been around the longest. What they enable you to do is use the sling as a conventional sling or for team type slinging up where you can utilize the weapon this way and just let it hang here if you need to transition to the handgun or whatever. There are a lot of copies of it, um, some good, some bad, the same as with everything else, but the Heckler & Koch one is the simplest. It works on one sliding buckle principle. This specific weapon 
has a couple of extra goodies on it. This four end is the latest offering from Laser Products who make, again, in my personal opinion, probably the best light attachments for shoulder weapons. Um, extremely reliable. This specific one, as opposed to the ones they've had out for the other weapons, has an on-off switch here, permanent on-off switch, a pressure switch here, and a disconnect switch over here so that you can disconnect it so that the light will not come on at all if you, if you don't require it. My personal opinion again, and all of this is obviously personal opinion, a light permanently attached to the shotgun is absolutely critical. There are ways of fighting with it. You can hit a target with a handheld flashlight. There are techniques for that, but you cannot control a situation. Uh, with a handheld flashlight, you need a flashlight mounted permanently affixed to the gun. It's one of the absolute priorities. Other things on this weapon, you'll notice except for the Super 90, these weapons all have short stocks. The biggest problem with shotguns is that people complain about being pounded when they're shooting, um, getting hurt, recoil, things like that. And the biggest cause of that is having a stock that's too long. Uh, a stock that's about 13, 13 and a half inches length of pull, in other words, from the trigger to the toe of the stock, will fit most everybody. Um, taller guys, as long as you shoot with your thumb on top of the stock, assuming you have no pistol grip on the weapon, um, it'll fit the taller guys, it'll fit the shorter guys, and there'll be no problem because that way you can get the stock inboard of your shoulder. And that's where the recoil problem occurs, is this way. So absolutely critical, a stock that's short enough to shoot a light attached to the weapon. And reliability, obviously extreme reliability. Over and above that, virtually everything else is an accessory that you may or may not require. This specific weapon was built by Scattergun Technologies it has a slight extension, it's a 14 inch barrel. Slight extension allows five, it allows an extra round which is five rounds in the mag tube and one in the chamber. This is a custom home built bolt handle, the 1100, 1187 series. The bolt handle's a little bit sharp, a little bit small to get hold of when pressure's on. It also has a modified button on the carrier to allow the action to work. The 1187's come out with an extremely small silver button which one tends to miss when you're loading and that button has to de be depressed every single time you load through the bottom. So this was made by Tanks Rifle Shop. Um, it's been modified, they're normally about this long. So this one's been cut down by over half, modified, rounded off and it gives just enough to allow the cartridge to feed, the button to depress, and to go on with your business. The sights, these again are scattergun technology sights. They normally cross pin and glue their front sights on. This one has been silver soldered on. I don't like sights that are not silver soldered. So all of my personal guns have the sights silvered on, those that do have aftermarket sights on them. Scattergun technologies also mounts the side saddle, which is made by Taxstar, the side saddle allows carrying six extra cartridges on the gun where you can get to them and it's irrelevant whether you're left-handed, right-handed, you can access it fast. Um, you always have six extra rounds with the gun. It's a much better way than going with one of the butt cuffs, butt stocks or whatever. Um, the only problem with them, and the manufacturers do say this in the warning, is not to turn down these screws too tight, especially with a weapon like the Benelli Super 90, which is lying on the table here, which has an aluminum s receiver. You can screw up the receiver too tight, pinch the action, and hamper the reliability of the weapon. Scattergun Technologies, again, they have two, they come out standard with two different size Allen screw heads. Scattergun Technologies has come out with two cross pins which have cutouts 
the same as the standard cross pin, trigger group cross pins on the weapons. And the heads are the same size and they slotted heads. So a real good idea, you can use a cartridge case to loosen them, tighten them, and they will work as trigger group pins irrespective of whether you have the side saddle on or not. Um, that again is available from Scattergun Technologies. Um, the 870, this 870 was built by Robar in Phoenix. Also again, the Hecklin cock sling on it, the side saddle, um, pressure switch on the one side, on off switch on the other side. This specific light mount takes a rechargeable battery which is not a good way to go in a gunfight. Um, you want to stay with the lithium, it has an extension on here which just screws off and you can put the standard lithium battery in. If you run a rechargeable battery, it's real good for training. The downside of the rechargeable battery is when it dies on you, it dies in about six or seven seconds. It goes from white light to zero. However, both of them do have approximately 45 minutes burning time, extremely high intensity output and uh, very good pieces of equipment. Again, it's an integral part of the weapon. It also needs to take a special side mounting bracket if you want to put a sling on and to clear the light when you're working the action. Otherwise, the light's going to hook on the bracket. So every time you put something on a shotgun, you need to think one step ahead. Again, the stock has been cut extremely short on this weapon, basically to fit me. Um, but a taller person, a bigger person can shoot this with ease again as long as the thumb is on top of the stock. Uh, very good weapon, prolific. There's probably more 870s around in law enforcement these days than any other pump action or slide action shotgun. Mossberg's very similar type weapon in use by the military. Um, they have a better position for the safety. The safety on the Mossberg is like the over and under shotguns. It's right over here. It's much easier to access the action release button, which on the 870 is, of, of, is over here, is behind the trigger on the Mossberg, which means you don't have to break your firing grip to work it, to operate it. So those two specific things on the Mossberg, I think, are better than the 870. Otherwise, they're equally as good guns. The 870 is virtually idiot-proof, virtually unbreakable. The Benelli Super 90 has become extremely popular in late years. There's the peculiarity of the Super 90 as opposed to any other semi-auto apart from the Beretta 1201, which is essentially the same weapon, is that if you insert a cartridge, and you do not depress the drop lever or the trigger, it will not feed around up from the magazine tube, which, as you will see later during a live fire, is an excellent fighting system when you want to switch ammunition types in mid-fight. To jump the cartridge up onto the, the drop lever, you either have to, onto the carrier, you either have to push the drop lever, which jumps it on, then you can run the cartridge in or the trigger trigger mechanism does exactly the same thing. So either way with this weapon, you cannot get into trouble. Uh, you cannot double feed it and, and block the action of the weapon. All you've got to do is just run the bolt because it won't feed another cartridge up from the chamber, from the magazine tube. Um, Pretty much reliable. They do have an aluminum receiver and a steel bolt running on that. They need to be kept lube, lubed. And the main difference between this semi-auto and this one essentially is that this is gas operated and this is recoil operated by a spring. And it is probably the heaviest recoiling shotgun um, out because of its recoil operation mechanical system. So. If you don't like recoil, you're not going to like a Super 90, basically because the stock is long and because the recoil operation is heavy. Um, not uncontrollable, it's not going to break your collarbone, but it's, it's definitely a lot heavier than either of these two. The 1187, probably the softest shooting 12 gauge around. Um, over and above that, 
there's about 15,000 different things you can buy for shotguns. Most of them you don't need. Um, as long as you have a light on the gun and a sling and a stock that is short enough that you can shoot the weapon comfortably and keep it inboard of your shoulder, uh, there's not really much you need. The one thing on these shotguns which people do not seem to understand is the chokes, the barrels and the choking system. Whatever, every single shotgun is different. Literally every single serial numbered shotgun is different. None of them will pattern the same. And by patterning, I'm talking about the overall diameter for of buckshot pattern for anti-personnel use. So if the gun is stamped cylinder bore, riot, half choke, three quarter choke, improved, modified, pull choke, it really doesn't mean a thing as regards the overall diameter of the pattern until you have test fired it, as you will see later, until you have test fired it with different brands of ammunition. Barrel length makes no difference. Um, the choke that's stamped on the barrel makes no difference. The weapons absolutely have to be individually test fired to get the, the shot pattern size if you are going to use buckshot, which most people do. A quick rundown on the variety of ammunition. It's, there's a plethora of ammunition available. A real quick rundown of some of the stranger stuff. Uh, tear gas, flares, this was a British round developed that wouldn't fit into any other 12 gauge if their guns were taken from them. This is a shock lock round for busting door locks, hinges. This is a World War II issued brass Remington round. This is a Russian brass cartridge. This is a silenced round which fires this projectile. Um, has to be alcohol, tobacco and firearms approved if it's assembled and it has a transfer fee on it. Experimental military steel slug. This is a bean bag which is a less than lethal round. It's rolled up into this cartridge and this is what it fires um, for non-lethal situations. Plastic shot. A variety of different slugs. This specific one is a sabo round and it is armor piercing, that specific round. These ones, the Sapo has two encapsulated shoes which take off when the cartridge leaves the barrel. This is a flechette which fires, usually they packed with 20 to 22 of these steel darts, um, essentially for penetrating brush. The rest of them are a variety of Types of slugs, rubber slugs, lead slugs, this is a single ball. You can get rubber buckshot, wooden rounds, plastic rounds, virtually anything that man's ever thought of. Probably the best slugs going quality wise, and they've been around for over a hundred years, are the Brennicke. German design slug, it's got a harder tip than most other slugs, a felt washer that's screwed to the base. Um, Outstanding slug, probably the best that you can get um, for overall performance. Um, there's a lot of stuff that isn't on this table, things like string buck, which may or may not be the answer to a gun that has got a really lousy buckshot pattern. And string buck consists of 250 caliber balls tied together with about a four inch piece of wire which means at worst case scenario, you've got a five inch pattern at worst. And at best, it can be anything from half an inch out. So that may warrant carrying if you really are forced, like in some law enforcement departments, forced to carry a specific shotgun, cannot modify it, cannot have the barrel modified and are required to shoot the ammunition that's issued to the department that year. So that's just a short upshot of it. Uh, Paladin Press does have another video um, which goes into a lot deeper detail of the ammunition systems for the 12 gauge. So we're going to keep that relatively short and get on to the guns and the different weapon systems. We're going to cover the loading and unloading of the three primary systems that are commonly in use. The Benelli Super 90 M1, which is a 
relatively unconventional semi-automatic. The 1187 Remington, which is a conventional semi-automatic, and the pump or slide action shotgun, which in this case is going to be an 870 Remington. Loading from an empty weapon with a Super 90, if the cartridge carrier is locked, you know the bolt's back, you know the weapon is out of ammunition, so the first cartridge is going to go through the ejection port because you cannot load through the bottom port in this condition. The cartridge should always be held by a right-hander with the brass part of the cartridge towards the little finger, immaterial of whether you're loading through the bottom port or not. So with the Super 90, the weapon is rolled over for a right-hander, cartridge is thrown in, you hit the release button, and then check the chamber. Always check the chamber. In addition with a Super 90, you need to let the bolt jump forward and pull on it. It's a rotate, rotary bolt and sometimes it doesn't go into battery, so you've got to be very careful with that, otherwise it won't fire when you press the trigger. The second and succeeding cartridges will go in through the bottom port. We now have a round in the chamber, the magazine tube is empty. To facilitate loading with that, most people wind up stuffing the cartridge too far forward when they're loading, trying to find the port. So what we do is run the cartridge rim along the trigger guard until you hit the, the loading port. Then invert your hand, shove it in. Next one, same thing again, brass towards the little finger along the trigger guard until you hit the loading port, rotate, shove it in. Essentially all loading done with a weapon in the shoulder. The reason for this is if you try and support the weight of the weapon like this, you will not hit a target from four or five feet because of the, of the shot size, the pattern size of the shot. It's like trying to shoot a rifle from this distance. Works on steel and paper targets, doesn't work on people when they're moving in the street. If you bring the muzzle up, the weapon is too easy to take away from you. You're blocking your vision, you lose all rev leverage, and if you have to use the weapon, you've got to mount it in here anyway. The weapons do get heavy somewhere around this angle you'll find all the weight coming off the weapon. So leave it in the shoulder when you load. Just let the weapon hang here. Use the trigger guard for a reference and you won't have a problem with it. To download the Super 90, there's two ways of doing it. The shell stop, which needs to be tripped on this weapon from where the camera is now pointing, it is the right side of the weapon. You can trip the shell stop once you've got the cartridge out of the chamber and release all the succeeding cartridges Except with a Super 90, often the shell stop size varies from gun to gun. So usually what we do with a Super 90 is download the first cartridge, roll it out. Bearing in mind that this will now not feed up any successful, successive cartridges, what to do is hit the drop lever, run the cartridge in, run it out. And just carry on doing that until the weapon is out of ammo. To lock back the action, press the drop lever, lock the action, do a visual check, and the weapon is now unloaded. The 1187 is primarily the same as the Super 90 just covered. Again, loading from an unloaded weapon, brass towards the little finger, first cartridge goes in through the ejection port, the button at the bottom on the carrier is hit, and again, an immediate press check to make sure there's a round in the chamber. From there, successive loading is exactly the same. All the successive rounds exactly the same. To download the 1187, you basically rack each round out, just one at a time. It's the easiest way to do it. Until the bolt locks open, a visual check, and that's the downloading on the 1187 and 99% of most conventional semi-auto actions. They feed a roundup every time the bolt is either manually or semi-automatically operated. It feeds a cartridge up from the chamber. So that is why it can be downloaded like it is. Um, that's why it's loaded like it is. Again, in the shoulder, ready for action. That's why you're loading the weapon. If something happens, you can go from there. The downloading, you can do it any which way you want, as long as the muzzle's pointed in a safe direction. Once you're downloading the weapon, obviously there's no chance of a threat. So you don't have to worry about being ready for action or anything along those lines. 
The pump gun or slide action shotgun, in this case a Remington 870, um, brings up a different kettle of fish as far as the loading goes. A lot of people load, like we've done with the last two weapons, through the side port, close it up. If you choose to do that, cartridge goes in through the side, close it up, hit the action release to break the action, which is now locked. Bring your hand back, check the chamber. And then the successive cartridges are loaded from there on out. The problem with this is the only time you will factually need to, lo to load the weapon this way is in the middle of a fight when you've run the gun out of ammunition. If you go on the basic concept that every time you fire a pump shotgun, after you fire, you run the bolt and close it again, the action is now locked. Which means if you run this thing out of ammo in the middle of a fight and choose to load through the side, you're now going to have to open the action, get a cartridge, throw it in, close the action, get back on target before you can fire. So what we prefer to do is load it every single time through the bottom port. If you stay with that system and you stay with the premise that every time you fire the weapon, you fire and you close the bolt straight afterwards, you won't have a mental problem trying to sort this out in the middle of a fight. In addition, most law enforcement patrol officers are carrying pump shotguns. Apart from the Ithaca 37, which has only one loading port, and that's in the bottom. The other weapons that have a loading port on the side, the chamber in what is called cruiser ready for law enforcement, the chamber is empty. The magazine has usually four rounds in it if it's a standard magazine, otherwise it may have more, but the chamber is empty. So to further reduce any mental conflict, if you load for cruiser ready that way and if you load for combat that way, in other words, putting the first cartridge into the magazine tube, racking it straight into the chamber and checking it, and then going from there on, you will do it the same way every single time. You won't have to think in the middle of a conflict. The only difference with cruiser ready and loading for a fight is that you wouldn't rack one into the chamber once you'd filled the magazine or put your four rounds in the magazine. So we prefer with the pump guns, again, to reduce the mental problem. First cartridge goes in again using a trigger guard into the magazine tube. It's racked in, press check the chamber, and from there, successive rounds are fed in one at a time until the magazine tube can take no more. And that's the loading system. That's the loading system we use during training. It's totally optional. Um, it depends on the individual trainee, how tight they can keep their rear end together when it hits the fan. To download the 870, there's a couple of ways to do it. The most common way is to break the action release. The first cartridge, you run the, the fore end back hard. First cartridge comes out, second one rolls out. You catch it in your hand. From where the video camera is now pointing on that side of the weapon, depress the shell stop and the cartridges will come out one at a time. The shell stop is one of the long bars. There's one on either side, one to stop the cartridges from coming out of the magazine tube with the action closed, one to stop them coming out when the action's open. Just trip them out one at a time and then do a visual check. This is especially important with weapons that are being kept vertical in vehicles when you're riding, some of the crimp on the cartridges you'll get polypropylene or the filler content above the wad coming out, binding up the magazine tube and the cartridge doesn't come out. So you need to do a visual, visual check. In addition, a weapon that has an extended magazine tube like this one has, you need a high quality magazine spring and an extended magazine follower. This one is made by Choate Manufacturing. Scattergun Technologies make them as well. And what it does, it has a male appendage on the end, which stops the spring from binding. If you've got a poor quality magazine extension spring, if you've got a poor quality magazine spring, the entire spring will bound up, bind up in this section. Obviously not releasing the cartridges out of the magazine tube. When you take the top end off, the spring comes out like gangbusters. So 
you're better off with a standard magazine length that is going to work than a, a, an extension magazine tube that doesn't work. You put one on, you put one on of good quality. The shooting stunts we're going to cover next and we're going to use a pump action shotgun, in this case an 870 again, essentially because it requires a little bit more manipulation than a semi-auto. It is no slower than a semi-auto to shoot, but it does require a little bit more manipulation. The main complaints as stated earlier on about a shotgun are the recoil and the muzzle rise, and they are two distinctly different things. The recoil you can control to a certain effect, but it's a matter of physics. What goes out the front comes out the back. So the idea is that the, the stock of the weapon needs to be pulled in tight inboard of the shoulder when you shoot. If you get it on your shoulder or anywhere else on your arm, it is going to hurt. If you leave the, st the toe of the stock loose inboard of your shoulder when you fire, it is going to hurt. There are some recoil reduction um, mercury filled rods that you can fit in some of the gun stocks but they really don't make a lot of difference. The muzzle flip is the important one because that allows you to get back on target fast and that is controlled by a slight kink in the front leg. The rear leg is kept straight. What it does is it forces the recoil or the muzzle rise and the recoil to travel straight through a diagonal line your body weight is behind the weapon, so the gun's got nowhere to go. It just comes straight up to here and back. It is not an exaggerated lean. It is just a slight kink to drop your body weight behind the weapon, which allows you to cover a full 180 degrees without moving your feet. Any further bend with this lead knee, and you're going to have problems covering further than 180 degrees. Bottom line with this, the thumb again on top of the stock so that you don't belt yourself in the nose, your eyes start tearing and you can't see for follow-up shots. The focus remains on the front sight or bead or whatever sighting system on this weapon, it's a ramped front sight. The focus remains there before, during and after ignition of the cartridge. Once you've decided or made the commitment that you are going to shoot, you need to be ready to shoot repeated shots. So we're going to start on target, unloaded weapon. The safety, if it needs to be depressed, is depressed with the tip of the trigger finger. You can either keep the finger straight with the safety off or depress the safety on the way up to target. The problem we have with our training with leaving the safety on as the fight starts is people are trained to keep their trigger fingers straight with handguns, revolvers, semi-auto pistols like a Glock, um, anything, any weapon essentially except the shotgun or Garand type rifles. We dislike with our training asking a person to do this with one style weapon and this with another style to depress the safety. So it's optional um, when we get the shooter up just now it'll be option for him. Um, this is not a statement that the, sh the safety should be left off. This is absolutely not a statement in that regard. This is just to state that if you are going to depress it, you depress it with the tip of your finger. If you're not going to depress it and you want it off, it stays off and your trigger finger stays straight and out of the trigger guard until you go into action. So having said that, on target, the safety is off, the finger is on the trigger. You fire the shot, Immediately run the bolt, get back on target, and the finger immediately comes back on trigger until you're off target. The action is now locked, it is ready for a repeat shot. There's only one reason to aim a weapon at somebody, and that is to shoot them. To shoot them, you need your finger on the trigger. If you are unsure about whether you're going to shoot them or not, you do not put your finger on the trigger and you don't aim the weapon at them. So in a low ready position, your finger would be off the trigger. If you're on target, your finger would be on the trigger, you fire, and once you've fired, do not break contact with the trigger and throw your finger off the trigger. Maintain contact with the trigger, release it enough to reset the mechanism, but don't break tactile contact with the trigger until you come off target. You're on target now. If you come off target now, immediately your finger comes off the trigger 
and you recover to a low ready position where you can see what's going on, contain the situation, and you cover down slightly left and right of your target to make up for tunnel vision, make sure that there's no other threat. Slight lean in when you fire, thumb on top, focus remains on the front sight, all the way before, during, and after the firing cycle until you bring the gun off target. Once that happens, the finger comes off the trigger, recover down to a low ready position, and low ready is where you can see what's going on below the threat level, whether it's optical or physical. After that, you contain the situation and wait for help to arrive, call law enforcement, or do a tactical retreat dependent on what your situation is. Um, always recover to the low ready after you fire. There's a tendency with a lot of shooters to fire the round and then bring the muzzle up like this. It is the easiest takeaway position in the world with a shoulder weapon. Um, it's not advisable, personal opinion. Always recover after firing. Bring the weapon down to a low ready position where you can see what's going on. Once you've controlled everything, then go ahead, reach for spare ammo if you have it, and reload the weapon. There is no rush to reload. Do not reload. Do not reload after you've fired with a weapon on target like this. The reason for that is totally tactical. If you need to reload, then you need need the weapon down where you can see what's going on. If the person needs to be shot again, you need the weapon on target and don't worry about reloading until you've contained the threat that's downrange. That is your primary purpose. So you carry on shooting, leave the gun on target while you're firing. If you're not firing, bring the gun off target with your finger off the trigger in the low ready position. And the low ready, the elevation of the low ready, elevation of the low ready, will depend on where the threat level is. This could be low ready, this could be low ready. We will cover three ready positions in this video before we're done. This is, a, this is the most commonly used position. Um, the other two are for varying situations, but this is the most commonly used position. It's where you can control a situation, see everything that's going on, and be ready for instant action if you need it. There's several optional tactical positions for lowering one's body line um, for various reasons. One, obviously, to make a smaller target of oneself, which really doesn't help if there's a potential of skip fire because you're going to get hit worse than if you were standing. Um, the first of them is the squatting position, and what that entails is lowering one's body line down to this basic position. It works really well, both there's support for both elbows on top of your knees. The only problem with this is if you physically cannot get both feet flat on the ground, the position's not going to work, you are going to roll over under recoil. Dead, steady, quick to get into, quick to get out of. It's a really good position if you can get into it. Alternates to that quick kneeling positions and I'm going to cover two of them. The one first originated by the FBI probably four or five decades ago with a handgun. All it entails is a large step forward towards the target. There's a big step forward and the reason one takes a big step is otherwise one's foot winds up with a heel off the ground and there's an imbalance problem. So it's a big step forward what this allows one to do, there is obviously no support for your elbow. What it allows you to do is change trajectory to elevate the shot. You can track a target sideways with this. It's quick to get into, it's quick to get out of. The bad news with this is stepping into a target, you're obviously getting closer and if you want to change trajectory, for example, a hostage situation, you are again elevating the battle weight where your opponent can get underneath the battle. If he does, not only is he going to take the gun away this way, he's also going to roll you over because there's nothing to support your body from going over. So there are disadvantages to it. If this position is used, it needs to be done quick and the muzzle immediately depressed after firing or after the job is done. 
recovery from this position would be to standing low ready to maintain control of the situation. The alternate to that is a double kneeling position. No step is taken. And all you do with that is roll both feet down, both knees on the ground. This again allows a change of elevation. It allows one to track a target sideways. Again, same problem with elevating the muzzle close up if you're using it for a trajectory change. It's very stable, it works real good and one of the big advantages of it is you can roll right side around the barricade, you can roll left side around the barricade exposing very little body area to, to take incoming rounds. To recover from this position, recover one step at a time that way you maintain your balance all the way through and maintain control of the situation. Patterning on shotguns is critical. Each and every individual battle is totally different. Patterning should be done yard by yard from about three yards out to about at least 25 yards. The purpose of the demonstration, what we're gonna to do today is shoot from about seven yards, three different types of ammunition, a, to illustrate the difference in ammunition, which makes a huge difference in pattern size when you switch from ammunition brand to ammunition brand. Then we'll switch shotgun barrels, put on a, a special shotgun choke barrel, and we'll see the difference on what they do. Going to run initially a round of Remington double aught buck, then a round of Winchester double aught buck, then a round of Federal tactical buckshot in double aught, which is the most prolific in use for anti-personnel anti use. So with that, we'll do it. That's the Revington. Winchester. This is Federal Tactical. Same sequence of fire, ammunition in the same sequence from top to bottom, Remington first. Just a second. And bottom hit will be Federal Tactical Double Art. As can be seen, this is the first one we've fired. This is the second one that's just been fired. A big difference in overall pattern uh, diameter. Neither of these two are still too wonderful, they are an awful lot better. There's still an amount of donutting with the Remington ammunition. Um, the Federal Tactical, this is the entire payload of nine pellets. So the choking has made a huge amount of difference in all three cases. The Federal Tactical ammo is obviously a lot tighter and it's essentially because of the lower velocity and the way the pellets are stacked in the cartridge. Um, this is not to say that Federal ammunition is better than Remington or Winchester, it's just in this specific load, in this gun, with this choke. Um, this is obviously what you want. With the Federal Tactical, with the battle we've just fired, um, 15, 20 yards, you're looking at a 4-inch overall diameter pattern with that weapon, which means something like a headshot can be done with absolute confidence, with absolutely no danger to bystanders. The total payloads in the target, you don't have to worry about flyers, donuts, anything else. This is probably about an inch across. In fact, we could measure it at seven yards. She's running just on an 
one and one sixteenth inches um, from side to side and top to bottom it's about one and a quarter inches so a tremendous pattern which if you're using buckshot this is what you require the bad news is the tighter the gun shoots the better you have to shoot every single time you fire obviously with this if you miss you miss in its entirety if you hit you're going to hit dead center a lot of the problems with shotgun shooting training in general is that most people shoot for the chest or the center of mass of the upper body area and unfortunately in a fight this is usually the fastest shrinking part of the body area when somebody's turned side on it shrinks from an area this big to something down to this big so if you blow the shot this way two inches either way um, you're in trouble where with one of these lesser desirable patterns you will probably catch him with a couple of pellets unfortunately you might catch a bystander as well so the bottom line with a shotgun or anything else for that matter is that the backstop has to be clean it has to be clear or at least you have to be cognizant of what's in the background before you shoot um, patterning to be done correctly as I said earlier on you need to do it yard by yard it does change by the yard so starting probably at about three yards I'd go back to about 25 yards with my own gun with different brands of ammunition um, and get something that stays relatively tight or at least that you know what the gun is doing for law enforcement where some officers have to, where you've got three or four officers who have to share a gun all three or four of them need to know what that one specific brand of buckshot is doing in that gun with the fact with the ammunition issue of that year. If you have a conventional sling on the shotgun, there are two essential common carry positions for these. What is termed African carry is muzzle down behind the weak shoulder or non-strong handgun firing side shoulder. To dismount from this position, left hand goes on the forend. All that you do is roll the bottom of the shotgun away from your body. The sight goes on the target now, the safety comes off now, you suck it back into the shoulder and you fire. And then recover to low ready. You'll notice that to get a decent pocket or gap in board of the shoulder on the shooting stones, what we were discussing earlier, some people may need to elevate this elbow all the way up. Some people can shoot low shoulder, but what you do not want to do is drop your head down to the gun. You want to bring the gun up to your head. The left arm or support arm goes as directly underneath the weapon as possible. To re-sling into the African carry, the shooting hand goes onto the back of the sling, and all you do is dump it over your shoulder, and that's it. Again, it's pretty quick, the same as the American carry, which I'll cover next. All you do, forehand on the forehand, roll the weapon off, punch the safety off, and you're on target. That's if you're running a conventional sling system like this. The alternate to that is American carry. American carry is strong side, muzzle up, behind the strong side shoulder, in this case a right-handed shooter, right-hand handgun, right-hand shotgun. To dismount from this position, the support hand, in this case the left hand, reaches between the sling and the body onto the forehand. From there, again the sight on target early, the safety is punched off now, and you're ready to go. To sling, the muzzle goes straight up, the weapon is slung over the shoulder. Again the dismount, again relatively quick, forehand onto target, safety off, and fire. And that's, that's the two commonest carry positions. African muzzle down, weak side, American muzzle up, strong side. If you do not have a sling on the weapon, a very safe way to carry this on the range or in the field or anywhere else is what's called pocket carry, which is this way. And the reason it's called pocket carry is because you can stuff your thumb in your pocket and support the weight, weight of the weapon like that all day long. But you have total control over the weapon, there's not a safety problem and it's low profile as are the other two. So those are the three basic carry positions whether you have a sling or whether you don't. 
transition of the shotgun to either the handgun or to open hands for whatever tactical reason it may be a mechanical malfunction it may be the shotgun's total capacity of ammunition's been depleted with a conventional shooting strap or shooting sling like this um, this is the way we do it for a right hander the right hand comes to the back of the sling the left arm goes through straight up and the weapon is dumped straight over this way from there and we are using a dummy pistol from there the pistol comes out to be used or one can go to open hands the obvious reason for this is to get the shotgun behind your back so that your opponent can't get to it and use it under no circumstances should the weapon be dumped on the ground and that's the major reason to have a sling on one of these weapons again to reiterate from here shooting hand comes to the back left arm goes through and it goes straight up the reason for that is if you leave the arm horizontal it in effect shortens the sling you'll either wind up knocking off your glasses or if you hang on to the shotgun too long the weapon will wind up around both shoulders and just slide down your body so it doesn't need to be timed to perfection but it's got to be done relatively smoothly and relatively by the by the step. Again, hand comes to the back, arm straight through, it's done. Handgun comes out, and that's it. If the handgun is being used. During training, when we are running a class, we get, in addition to pulling the handgun, if it's a matter of transitioning to the handgun, we pull a flashlight at the same time. Most people don't have flashlights permanently attached to their handguns and if it's a night situation or a dark ambient light situation, you still need to be able to see. So straight after the transition, the flashlight is pulled and the handgun comes out with it. Some people, there's a fair predominance or fair per percentage of people who shoot the shoulder weapon left-handed, handgun right-handed or vice versa. The only difference with those people is the non-firing hand comes to the back of the sling. The same transition is done, and the only difference after that is the foot position needs to be changed. If you're switching from left to right, obviously your shooting stance is going to be reversed. But that is the only difference. Again, left-handed shoulder weapon shooter shooting, shooting right hand handgun right hand comes to the back of the sling, left arm goes through, foot position has changed and all the flashlight is pulled. With the Heckler and Koch team style sling the transition is plain and simple. All that one does is lowers the weapon, keeps the stock trapped to give clearance for the handgun to come out. Once the handgun is passed there, normal shooting position can be assumed. Again a little bit quicker this is a fast transition it has to be done fast any transition has to be done fast because of the tactical ramifications of the situation from here weapons drop trapped handgun is out and you're ready to go okay steve what we're going to do is load up don't forget close the action load it leave the weapon in your shoulder let the muzzle droop to take the weight off the weapon Keep your eyes on the target. We're going to load from the side saddle. There you go. Use the trigger guard straight into the mag tube. Rack it in immediately and press check it. There you go. Now you fill up the remainder of the magazine. If the muzzle's getting heavy, just let the muzzle droop. Okay, we're going to do this slow and careful. You can go ahead and refill the side saddle from the ammo you have in your pocket. And once we've got that filled up, we're going to take a slow and careful. Your first round will be from the low ready position, safety selection of your choice. You can have it either on or off. If you have it on, when you come up onto target, push it off with the tip of your trigger finger. Once you've fired, pump the action, back on target, refocus the sight, then your finger comes off the trigger, bring the gun down to low ready, cover down left and right of your target, make sure what you've got, and if you're satisfied with what you've got, 
then go ahead and reload what you fired. There is no rush to reload. The, the problem is down there. We've got to contain that problem. Once that's contained, then we can worry about reloading. Okay. okay? Let's try it. Don't forget to lean in when you fire. Stay on target all the way through and after the firing cycle. Safety selection of your choice. Ready? One round, any of the three targets that you want. It's all yours. Ready? Shoot! Finger back on the trigger, Steve. That Not now. Now she comes off. When you're on target, your finger stays on the trigger. The tendency, what happens is people, as soon as they fired the round, they jump the finger off the trigger. You're going to lose more shots with your finger going this way after ignition than coming back this way and jerking on the trigger. Okay. Okay, go ahead and reload what you fired from the side saddle. The bottom line rule is your finger stays off the trigger when you're off target, but it stays on the trigger all the time. So all you're going to do is release the trigger mechanism enough to reset the hammer sear, and then you're going to stay on target with your finger on the trigger. Then if the target or the problem is solved, your finger comes off the trigger, you come down to low ready with your finger off the trigger. Okay. Okay, safety selection of your choice. Make sure it's on or off as you wish. One round, ready? Fire! Cycle it, finger back on the trigger. There you go. Threw it off momentarily, but that's a lot better. Now you cover down left and right of the, of the target. You keep your head behind the gun, just in case there's somebody else there that you haven't taken in with tunnel vision. Now you're satisfied with the situation. Now you go ahead and reload from the side saddle. Run it along the trigger guard. The tendency is to go too far forward of, of that uh, bottom loading port. So if you just run the rim along the trigger guard every time, you can keep your concentration downrange and you'll find the port every time. Okay. Let's try it. Two rounds. You can run them either on one target or on two separate targets. That's your choice. Once you're done, you come down, cover down, and then reload what you fired. You can't count. In a fight, you really can't count how many rounds you fired. The hotter and heavier the fight, the less you can count. So what you're going to do is just load it until it won't take any more after the action's over. Ready? Okay. Safety selection of your choice. Two rounds. Ready? Shoot! Good. And you cover down on the entire scenario. Looks good. And then load what you fired. The second ready position was originated by a man called John Satterwhite. Um, it's called a high ready, Satterwhite ready, or it's known by half a dozen different names. But essentially the principle is if your head were now the target, I have your head and the front sight already in one plane. And the theory is that if I line that, your head, the sight, and my eyes up in one plane, all I have to do to shoot is to pop the safety mount the back of the gun and fire because the sight is already on the target so all I'm doing is rotating the back of the shotgun and shooting as soon as I get my cheek weld and as soon as it's in here I can fire the objective is not to elevate the muzzle dip it in this that and the next thing just to rotate the back of the gun around the muzzle and fire um, it's very fast and the the objective is if you're scanning for something, if I were looking for your head, I'd keep my eyes and the sight in one plane, and then eventually the theory is when I see your head, the sight is already on the target. Um, it's very fast. It's a good position for distance. Um, very dangerous close-up, obviously, because you're blocking your view over here, and again, the weapon can be taken away from you. Anytime anybody gets underneath a shoulder weapon, you're in trouble. He's got all the leverage advantage for everything. For takeaways, he can break your wrists, he can break your fingers, he can take the gun away from you. So you need the weapon low. So bottom line, if you use this, not real advisable in close quarters, and once you've delivered the shot, cycle the gun, get back, same thing as usual, bring the gun down where you can see. Don't bring it back to a high ready or set a white ready. The indoor ready position is used for extremely close quarters searches, extremely slow searches, and extremely
tight quarters where one doesn't want to project the muzzle past, for example, a building corner or whatever. There are two ways or two positions for it. The one is to bring the muzzle off for a right-handed shooter right off to the left side of his body. If the hand stays in contact with the leg when you're moving, you know exactly where the muzzle is, there's no chance of crossing your feet. The main objective, obviously, is not to project the muzzle anywhere past your leading foot. Um, to avoid gun takeaways, telegraphing your position. The alternate to that is to come down between your legs, again keeping a muzzle tight back. The basic reason for all of this is keeping it in close. Um, and again, extremely slow movement, extremely close quarters. When mounting, one has to be careful not to overswing the target for a right-hander out to one o'clock overswinging because the left elbow is extended. So again, the left elbow needs to be under the, underneath the weapon, dead on target when you mount. One of the reasons for having the two variables of the position is if, for example, I needed to hook a left-hand corner over here with a cement brick wall, and I had the weapon over on my left side. If I take one small step, pick up whatever the threat is here and attempt to mount the gun from here, it's gonna smash into the wall. So in that case, I'd prefer it over here between my feet so that when I do rotate, I've got complete control and I've got clearance for the muzzle when mounting onto the target. Similarly, a right-hand corner, for example, I'd want it over on the left side so that I could rotate this way and be up on target if I needed the use of the weapon. So let's try that high ready position. Out of the shotgun on your belt, safety selection of your choice and what you're doing obviously is got your eyes, the front sight and the target in one horizontal plane. The safety's on, don't forget to push it off. If it's not on, your finger stays straight. This will be one round, the rest of the follow through is the same as normal. Do not recover to a high ready, recover to a low ready so that you can see that the weapon can't be taken away from you, okay? Okay. Let's try it. Ready? Shoot! Cycle it, come down, cover down, and reload. Let's try it again, high ready. Two rounds, either on the same target or two individual targets, that's your choice. Ready? Shoot! Cover down, cover down on both targets. Reload what you've fired. Once you've done that, refill the side saddle from your pocket supply if you would, please. And then we'll try the indoor ready. Either from between your feet or off to your left side, that is totally your choice. Remember when you mount the gun this time from the end already, the tendency is to overswing the target out to one o'clock. So make sure you lock up this elbow where it normally is and this one underneath the weapon so you don't overswing the target. And let's try it. End already. There you go. Muzzles all the way back. Safety selection of your choice. One round, then follow through and reload. Ready? Shoot! Good. Keep it in your shoulder. Reload. Use the trigger guard when you run that cartridge in, Steve. Indoor ready again, either between your feet, off to the side. That's totally your choice. Okay, we'll try that one. Now don't forget, if you're walking with that one, that one is extended possibly six inches in front of either of your lead feet. So whether you step off with your left foot or your right foot now, the muzzle's going to be slightly more further forward than if you were back off to the side like you've just fired. So be aware of that if you get caught in this tactical situation. All right. Two rounds, two separate targets. Ready? Fire! It's a dynamite hit. Cover down, reload when you're done. Steve, you've already shot multiple targets. What I'm going to do is explain the principles of it. You've already shot two round strings and everything else, and you've shot them pretty quick. The reason I need to explain it is a lot of people say that a semi-auto is a lot faster than a pump shotgun. Um, it isn't. 
there's a technique with a pump shotgun and John Satterwhite, whom I mentioned earlier, is actually faster with a pump shotgun than a semi-auto shotgun. So it's the singer, not the song. She is unloaded, if you would just check it quickly. The principle with this, where you get the speed, is normally what you're doing is you're mounting up, firing, cycling, back on target. What we're going to do with this is use the recoil such as it is in the muzzle flip to pump the action and shift onto the next target. You already know, you've already predetermined what your next target is when it comes to multiple targets. And what we're going to get down to is shooting three steel plates. Having already predetermined what, what the target is, you can shift onto the target immediately after firing. Then what you do is once you've done the whole bunch, you come down low ready, cover down on all three and pick up whatever remnants haven't been terminated, oh, I shouldn't say terminated, haven't been stopped or whatever. And again, we're not talking about killing, we're talking about incapacitating, immediate incapacitation. So the principle is opposed to what you have been doing, which again was this cycling and back on target, then finger off and coming down. What you're going to do is fire, use a little bit of recoil such as it is to cycle the bolt and roll onto the next target and ready to shoot. That's all it is. So basically, we're going, in this case I'm going from left to right on the three targets that are downrange for me now. So basically I'm going from here Bang, I'm on the next one. If I wanted to fire on that one, it's bang, cycle, and I'm on the next one. In quick sequence, it'd be boom, boom, boom. Cover down on all three. Okay, again, running a wider sweep. If we had a wider angle on it, this is what it would be. Covering down. Finger staying on the trigger all the way through until the job is done, then the finger comes off immediately and covering down. And that's all there is to it. You've already done it in practicality. All we're talking about is the theory. And trying to get rid of the myth of a pump or slide action shotgun being slower than a semi-auto. It isn't. The only difference is you have to operate it. Okay, you've got three steel targets. Don't forget, this is where that lean-in is critical because if you don't, this is where the muzzle starts rising more and more, taking you more and more off target. So lean in is solid, you need to keep a solid in your shoulder, pull it in with your shooting hand, not with your lead hand, you just keep that one weak. All that does is support the weight of the weapon. But keep it in solid in your shoulder, lean in when you shoot. You've got three steel targets, you can go left to right, right to left, center, right, left, whatever order you want to go from, whatever ready position you want to go from, whatever safety selection you want to go from. Let's try it. Whenever you're ready, Steve, on your own. Go ahead. Okay, cover down on all three, reload. The one, the action stuck on you a bit, and that's basically, that wasn't you. That was the ammunition. Um, you can shoot a little bit faster. What you've got to realize is you're shooting a shot pattern that's just inside the, the pattern size of the plate. So we're at optimum distance with that gun, with the ammunition you're shooting for the, for the target size. So you can, you can pick up the speed. You're plenty good enough a shooter to shoot a little bit quicker than that. Don't, again, don't shoot faster than you can hit. But as soon as you've burnt the first one, start running the bolt onto the second one. We'll pick up the speed a bit. If you blow a shot, we'll tap it off a bit. Okay. But just try and smooth it out, the transition between targets. Let's try it. Whenever you're ready, take off on your own. Okay, fix the second one, fix it. You're shaking your head, Steve. You know you've blown the shot, so fix it. And then you, then you reload. Okay, we're almost sooner or later. The problem's not to stand there yelling at yourself. The problem's to fix the hit, and then we'll worry about it afterwards. So now we know how fast you cannot go. It's early days. We're real early in the training program. It'll pick up as we go, next day and the next day. Okay, right now we know how fast you cannot go. Don't let me talk you into shooting faster than you can hit. Okay. First time you had three good hits, second time lost a shot. 
If you blow the shot, fix it immediately. Okay. Let's try it again. Ready? Shoot! That's better. Much better. We can shave a little bit of time off as the days go by. Tomorrow, the next day, we'll pick up the speed. Steve, we're going to go ahead with slow foot movement. And this is the operative word here is slow. You're on a slow search. We can run it when you live fire it. If you go from indoor already, slow your foot speed down to snail space. If you're going from low ready, it means you've got some kind of control over the situation. You're not too concerned about telegraphing your position with a muzzle. The operative thing here is your footwork. So being right-handed, we're going straight in that away towards the target stand. When you step out, you step out with your left foot. Bring your right foot about halfway up. You want to keep your feet separated. If you don't, you're going to start losing balance. If you get your feet close together and there's any kind of trash on the ground, that's where the problems are going to occur. So stepping in this way for going low ready could go at about this pace. So we're going indoor ready and it were a real slow search. We're worried about a real close quarters problem, probably at about this pace. Literally at about that pace. keeping your feet separated. Backing up is a whole different kettle of fish. Again, you don't want to get into a gunfight unless you absolutely have to. So the logical thing to do, even though being a martial artist, as you know, the, the Chinese and Japanese strategies of war, withdrawal is the 36th of 36 strategies. But that's neither here nor there. The bottom line, these days in an urban situation, a civilian situation, or anybody else for that matter, if you can get out of it, you get out of it. So a scenario here is you've walked into something and it's a little bit more than you'd care to chew on. So you want to retreat tactical withdrawal. What you've got to be real careful of is your footwork and what you don't want to do again is get your feet together because you have no balance, especially backing up. So what you're going to do, there is no point in going from end already now, that close quarters position, because you're backing up. The threat's in front of you, so probably in low ready. And you're going to use your right foot, you being right-handed again, use your right foot like an antenna. And feel your way back, physically contact the ground, and then bring your left foot back about halfway. Feel your way again. Any obstacle you encounter, you can feel your way around it. <clears throat> Excuse me, the objective is not to get caught literally flat footed. Um, having something an inch behind your foot, you don't know it's there, and you've got both your feet close together. The minute you step back this way, you're going over. So if, if you don't know it's there and you step now, you've still got a modicum of balance. So you feel your way back this way and back on up until you can get out of there, preferably as always, solving the problem without gunfire. Okay? Okay. Let's just try it real quick with this, and then we'll run you live fire with an operational weapon. Okay. Just moving in, you can go either low ready or indoor ready. It's totally at your discretion. Keep your feet separated. Keep your balance. There you go. Okay, hold over there. Let's try backing up. Feel your way back with your right foot. Keep contact all the way through. Now bring your left. There you go. Okay, Steve, you're in business. We can shuck that uh, red gun. We'll go with a live operational weapon and we'll go from there. Check it. She is loaded. And once you've got your protection on, we'll go straight away. I'm going to leave you to your own devices. I am going to yell out fire every now and again. You stop and shoot. This is not shooting on the move. We'll cover shooting on the move as a separate entity. That's when you're going at about three, four, 
three or four mile an hour and shooting while you're moving. This, you stop and shoot. Okay. Don't forget your cover down after you've fired, reload, scan, reload, everything else, and then I'll talk you back. Okay. Let's try it. Low ready. Low ready or indoor ready. Okay, start moving in slowly. If you go from the indoor ready, bring it right down to snail space. If you're going from low ready, that'll work. Any of the targets is your choice. Fire! Good, good hit. Dead center hit. Cover down, reload, keep your eyes on the target. Keep your feet separated, Steve. Don't get them too close. Shoot! It's a little bit off to the left. It's about 9 o'clock on the plate. Don't forget your pattern size is shrinking down. Don't forget you're running a shotgun. Okay, hold over there, Steve. We're going to start withdrawing you. Start backing up. You have to think about the pattern size. Closer you get, you're shooting almost a rifle. You've got to be dead on. It's real easy to miss with a shotgun close up. Just keep tracking your way back. Two rounds on two separate steel targets. Shoot! Good. Good hits, dynamite hits. Cover down on both. Start backing up and load while you're backing up. Keep your eyes on the target. Keep it under control. You've still got ammunition, but you're trying to get out of there. Okay, Steve, hold where you are. Safety on and sling it if you would, please. Good hits, except for that close one. You need to be careful with the close hits. Don't forget your pattern is shrinking right down with a shotgun. So you've got to shoot it like a rifle close up. Okay. Extremely easy to miss at close quarters. Okay? Okay. Okay, we're going to get into some snap shooting. And snap shooting essentially is quick shooting from a standing position. There's essentially only two intelligent tactical reasons for shooting from standing. The one is you can't access the target from a lower, better, more stable position. Um, and the other one is time. You don't have the time to get into a better position. So essentially we're going to run this. This is a quick shot, but it requires perfection with marksmanship, follow through, sight picture, follow through on the sights, follow through on the trigger. We're running on that center steel target down there. Um, it's a relatively easy shot. It's not a difficult shot, but it's not a gimme. So you have to stay with the basics, the basic principles of shooting. Dead center hits. And what this does, this gives you the leeway where you've, you've got diversion with pattern spread and everything else with buckshot. We're going to run it with slugs. This gun will stay inside four inches at 100 yards. We're running at about 25, 30 yards now. So it's a relatively easy shot. The shot should be made once you've perfected it and granted we're still at the beginning stage of the training. But the shot should be made at about a second, second and a half from this distance with a dead center hit. Okay. So what we're going to do is start you off probably low ready. It'll be ready position of your choice, safety selection of your choice. When you get the fire command, mount the gun, sights on, stroke the trigger through, cycle the action, recover to low ready, cover down and then go ahead and reload. And we'll see how it goes. With your shooting ability, we shouldn't have a problem. Um, we'll see how it goes. What this does, as I said earlier on, it gives you the leeway where you don't have to worry about buckshot, pattern spread, and everything else. You can shoot this like a rifle, and you can shoot it into four inches at 100 yards from a decent shooting position. So with that, we'll try it, and we'll see how it goes. Low ready, Steve. Check the weapon. Make sure you load it to capacity with slug. And then we'll go one round per command. Ready? Shoot! Dead center hit. Perfect. Absolutely perfect. Again, exactly the same thing. Ready? Shoot! Low ready. Safety. Uh, cancel. I beg your pardon. Go ahead and reload. Safety on. Sling it.
What I'm going to do is demonstrate what is commonly called select slug, which essentially is transitioning from one ammunition type to another. I'm going to demonstrate it with three different weapon systems, and then Steve is going to live fire the drill and demonstrate it with an 870 Remington. We're going to start off with the Benelli Super 90 because it's this and the Beretta 1201, um, as discussed earlier, are peculiar weapon systems as opposed to conventional semi-automatic. Bearing in mind, as we discussed earlier, that if you run the, the cocking handle on a Super 90, it will not feed up another round from the magazine tube unless you depress the drop lever or operate the trigger mechanism. This is a really good system for the select slug drill. What it entails, the scenario that's entailed here is that the ammunition that's in the chamber is not applicable to the tactical scenario that you have to solve with gunfire. Um, an example would be somebody at 25, 30 yards in a crowded area and you've got buckshot in the chamber, which is what I have now. The gun is loaded with buckshot and what I'm going to do is transition and get a slug into the chamber as quickly as possible, reduce the weapon down to a single bullet firing capability and not have to worry about bystanders and problems like that. With a Super 90 for a right-hander, you get a hold of the slug, bring it up underneath the weapon to here. Then all that remains to be done is pull hard on the bolt handle, drop the cartridge in, and the slug is now in the chamber and ready to fire. Obviously, you could put it into the magazine tube, fire the cartridge that's already in the chamber, and then it will automatically self-cycle the slug into the chamber, and you could fire that. But for the purposes of what we're discussing now, you do not have the tactical leeway to do that. So again, to get the job done, I now obviously have a slug in the chamber, but I'm going to insert another one just for clarity. Slug comes underneath, yank hard on the bolt handle, drop it in, and you're ready to operate. Left-handed, because of the mechanics of trying to pull this back while you've got a cartridge in your hand, obviously it's not going to work. So for the left-hander, you'd insert into the magazine tube, hit the drop lever with your thumb, run the bolt and then the weapon is ready to fire the drop lever, obviously jumping the slug up onto the um, carrier. To press check the weapon left-handed, you can bring the bolt back, check with your finger. Same with the pump guns, you hit the action release on the 870 here, Mossberg's over here, different guns are different. You hit the action release, just bring the pump back and feel in the chamber with your right thumb. That we did not cover earlier on, um, logically because most people are right-handed, but that is your press check system for the semi-auto for the pump gun that would be over here with your thumb. Again left-handed and again I have a slug in here now. To get this done, cartridge out, insert straight into the mag tube, hit the drop lever, run the bolt and the job is done. The pump action Remington 870 like most pump guns except Essentially, the Ithaca 37, which does not have a side port, a side loading or ejection port, you essentially have to go through the bottom into the magazine tube first. So to switch ammunition in this or to select slug, again, you get your slug, load it straight into the magazine tube, hit the action release, jack the live round out, and you then have the slug in the chamber. Left-handed, the operation would be exactly the same. The Remington 1187 is a conventional type semi-automatic shotgun and by conventional I mean obviously it's not the same principle as the Benelli Super 90 M1 or the Beretta 1201. It's done exactly the same, the select slug situation or drill is done exactly the same, the technique is the same as the pump guns. Only difference being you're running a bolt handle instead of pumping the forend. Okay. Same thing again, you latch onto the slug, insert into the magazine tube, Run the bolt extremely hard on the 1187s to get them to cycle manually and you're in business. You've got your slug in the chamber. Okay, Steve, we're going to do that select slug drill live fire. Go ahead, low ready, check that you've got buckshot in the weapon. And what I'm going to ask you to do is two rounds on two separate steel targets, get a slug into the weapon and drill that gentleman down there in the woods. Okay, it's too far away for for buckshot, 
the back stops a little bit dicey there may be something in the woods behind so you've got to be careful you've got to get a dead center hit and have nothing flying past him concentrate on the marksmanship think about your tactics safety selection of your choice ready go good good hit make the shot Cover down. Safety on and sling it, please. Everything looked pretty damn good, Steve. What I'm going to do is go on down. I'll drag his carcass up here and we'll check your head. Okay, Steve, we're good. It's perfect. This is a fresh target. Target slightly angled in towards you. Absolute perfect angle of entry. So a real good job, got the job done, no over penetration, no buckshot flying around in the woods. And that's the name of the game. This is a target system we've evolved over the years. Um, there's movement, we can move any one of the targets we've got set up, but obviously the body's a humanoid in shape, or the target's a humanoid in shape. Um, three-dimensional which causes problems obviously with shooting a lot of people shoot on one-dimensional targets but this has lateral and fore and aft movement it's got lateral movement this way and this way and the scenario we've got set up here obviously is a no-shoot target here a shoot target here and an innocent bystander in the back once this entire setup is put into operation during our training. Um, as we'll see later on in the video, uh, it's the pattern size of buckshot. It's a difficult situation at the best of times, but when it comes to the 12 gauge and you like to use buckshot, it's pretty obvious that if you don't know the size of your, your buckshot diameter of the pattern, you're in big trouble here and the shot is just not on. You cannot take a shot here for liability reasons or anything else. So the total movement we normally use with this would be something along the lines of this. The trainee about five, six yards from the target. Um, and as you can see, the target availability chops and changes as we're going. And uh, both targets moving. And the idea is to put direct hits that go in deep and would exit deep. Obviously, in this case, you couldn't put a shot from here because you're going to hit that guy. Um, if you run it from here, you'll get availability somewhere sooner or later. Maybe a head shot here that can bypass the other guy. Maybe go down to kneeling, stick around through here, bypass that one. Uh, pelvic shots are often overlooked real good with a 12 gauge you're running between five and six hundred grains of lead it will probably br break his transmission his gearbox whether or not it will stop it his trigger finger from working is a moot point and it depends on the threat the specific threat that's occurring at the time if this were a knife situation um you'd probably do it if it were the classic hostage style target situation with a gun at this head, it would probably have to be a headshot to cut off his computer. Okay, Steve, here we go with the big one. The guy in the middle with the ratty check shirt is the bad guy. The kid is obviously not to be hit, and the bystander, onlooker, or innocent party behind is not to be hit. So you're going to have to thread the needle with us. You've got buckshot and you've got slug. You can use either. We're going to start you off with buckshot. You've already loaded with buckshot. So if you elect to go to slug, you're going to have to go to that after the drill has started. Okay, there is no time limit on this. There's a lot of different body availability, pelvis, chest, head. You're going to get differing target availabilities. It's up to you when to decide and what's available to you critical to follow through after you've fired and be ready to take another shot. If you look for the hit, you're probably going to butcher one of the innocent parties. Okay, so we need a good clean shot, either torso, head or pelvis, something that's going to go in deep, real deep angle. And it's totally your choice, buckshot or slug. Um, 
in the street, if you were armed with a handgun, then you could just transition, go to the handgun, if that were your choice. In this case, buckshot or slug, and I'm asking you to stay to the, to, with that restriction. Okay. And we'll see how it goes. We're going to stay at this distance. This is normal confrontational distance for this type of ugly situation. Um, make it clean and absolute bottom line. Follow through, get the sights back on the target, the, the action pumped, and ready to stick him again. Okay. Okay? And we'll see how it goes. Go ahead, stand by, ready position of your choice. Just double check that you are loaded with buckshot. You're going to have lateral movement. You're going to have sideways movement. Both targets will be moving. You're going to have to thread the needle, follow through after you've fired, and we'll see where we go with this. Okay, anytime you're ready, Steve, wait it out. There is no rush on this. Wait it out. Take a shot when you have a shot. Hey Steve, let's go on down, let's have a look. I know the hit was good. Guy at the back is clear. You ran it in at about that angle. The target situation was about that. He was moving this way. He was angled across this way, went straight in over here. The hit, we've got nine pellets. This is a, a self-shrinking material, so that the pellet holes are not the full 33 caliber. They look like 22 caliber holes, but knowing your pattern size, is where this counts. Your entire pattern is inside there. Obviously the wad got itself buried in there as well, which I can't get it out right now. But that's your overall pattern diameter size. She's clear. He's clear. There's nothing out in the street. You've gone right through the upper brain. Um, perfect shot. So the follow through is what does it. And you've just got to keep your cool and just hang, hang cool until you get a shot available. You might have had something like this available. You may have had a pelvic shot out here. Um, whatever was available to you, you took. And it's going to depend on body height. It's de obviously going to depend on what this monkey is doing with her. But uh, you're never going to get a better one than that. That's that's the big one. Good She's job. Safe. Oh, yeah. She is happy, happy little camper. Strange hair color, but she's happy. As stated at the beginning of this video, it is not a training tape. It is personal opinions, personal views, and they are to be taken as such. It doesn't mean I know anything. Um, what they are, are a little bit of knowledge, which hopefully you did not have before you bought the video, and hopefully you've gained something out of it. Hollywood's done.